is British music journalist and author Jessica Dushan. Jessica writes for the independent newspaper as well as many other publications. She's written plays, novels, and she interviews some of the world's finest classical musicians. And I'm so pleased she's joined me here today at Steinway Hall in London. Welcome. Thank you, Melanie. Lovely to chat to you today. Likewise. I'm going to start by asking all about your beginnings musical education, how you became interested in classical music. I know you played the piano, so what age did you start? Did you come from a musical family? Um, I started playing the piano when I was three. Did you? I did, yes. It was, that, it was that sort of family. It was a typical sort of, I guess, uh, fairly, fairly typical of its time, I would say, my family. Um, my parents were respectively a research scientist and a housewife. I was the youngest of three. My brother played the violin and the piano both extremely well. My sister played the cello. And um, I was started on the piano at the age of three and um, promptly was expected to go to Oxbridge, I would say. <laughs> so which teachers then were crucial, do you think, in your development? Um, I, because I didn't start taking the piano seriously until relatively late, when I was 16, um, I had been to teachers before then who I think had never pushed me particularly and they had let me explore my musical enthusiasms to a remarkable degree. Mm -hmm. I was playing lots of interesting things by Schubert and Beethoven and uh, I hungered for Chopin, absolutely hungered for Chopin um, and couldn't manage it very well at the time. And then I realised after that that if I was going to pursue this as more than just a sort of backroom enthusiasm, I was going to need to get a different kind of training. Mm. And I was recommended to go to Joan Havill, who I'm very pleased to say was able to take me on mm. at the time. So I was already at university by that stage, right. so I had to do a lot of extra practising on top of the very demanding course that I was on which actually didn't particularly like it if you played a musical instrument. It was a very academic course. Um, but Joan basically turned my technique around in three years flat and got me playing things in time for my graduation that I had never believed I would have got me at. So I'm unbelievably grateful to her. She's, she's a very really, fine teacher, isn't she? She's remarkable. Mm. And she's such a wonderful psychologist as well. I remember the first time I met her, she kind of looked at me as if she was trying to assess you know, every last bit of my soul in one fell swoop. Gosh. <laughs> so when did you start to write? Um, I actually started writing long before I took the piano seriously. I tried to write my first novel when I was about 12. Very and young. Uh, much to my mum's amazement, I finished it and then said I want to write another one now. Um, so my mother was fairly long class by this, but I was happy as the day was long I was writing. I had this sort of classic typewriter that I sat in my attic room, tapping away on in my fingerless gloves. So you knew from that age you wanted to, to be a writer? Oh yes, yes, yeah. absolutely. You've written so many concert reviews and have interviewed some fantastic artists. Which ones stand out? Which ones have become... Um, your favourites that you've interviewed? Um, well, there's there's been a lot of them over the last yes. 25 well, years, I must so many. say. Um, it's very, very hard to pinpoint kind of favourites, but I mean, of the pianists, um, one really rewarding thing is that because the classical music world is rather small and because I specialised for quite a long time in piano, mm. Um, I tended to get to see the same people many times over and after a while you get to know them yes. quite well and they, if they like what you write they start to trust you. And I've been very, very lucky to have long in-depth conversations over the years with people like Christian Zimmermann and mm. Andras Schiff oh. um, and um, quite a number of others as well. I was lucky enough to get an actual interview with Marta Argerich a couple of years this ago. This is fascinating, yes, I remember you saying that. Do, do tell us about that. Well, I, I got a call from BBC Music magazine one day saying, we'd like you to go to Rome and follow Marta Argerich around until she talks to you. And I said, ha, 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 <laughs> that'll be the day. Yes. And next thing I knew, there I was in Rome talking to Marta Argerich. Fantastic. Um, I didn't have as long an interview with her as I would have liked, but given that she hardly ever does interviews at all, I felt remarkably lucky. Mm. And it really puts you on the spot when you have, just when someone says, okay, just a few minutes then. Um, you have to think, what is the one question in the world that I most want to ask Marta Argerich? 
which was, it was how do you make that incredible sound? Yeah. And I was concentrating on that. Yeah. And she started talking. And that was really wonderful. Oh, God. It's very inspiring. Basically, she said that it's, uh, it's all in the imagination, that you have to be able to imagine the sound before you can make it. Yes, right. You've written several plays. Um, what was the inspiration for writing in that medium? Tell us about you know, what inspired you. And they're all based around music, aren't they? They are, indeed. Um, I have to say that they were all um, commissions, actually. They were all things I was asked to do. Um, and without that stimulus, I probably would have thought, well, I've never written a play, I don't know I can do that. Uh, but my friend Philippe Graffin, the violinist, phoned me up when it was about to be Messiaen Centenary a few years ago. And he said, I would love you to write for my festival a play introducing Messiaen's quartet for the end of time. And I said, but I've never written a play. I'm not sure I can do it. And he said, well, you're not going to find out unless you try, are you? That's true. And he had a point. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, that was, and then you, you're dealing with certain parameters of practicality mm. and a thing like that. So I ended up with a two-hander. And over the last few years, this play has kind of evolved and improved, and I've written and rewritten and tweaked. And um, I think it works reasonably well now, Touchwood. Mm. But that was how that began. And that was the quartet for the, for the end of time. Yes, it's, it's a yeah. contemporary story about a couple who are long divorced, but come together for the first time in a couple of decades mm. to hear the Messian Quartet for the end of time, which turns out to have a very special significance for the two of them. And the next performance of that is going to be in Brighton on the 9th of May, in a wonderful series called Music of Our Time. And you've written another, another play as well, I believe? Yes, you just a couple of months ago, I wrote my first full-length play, which is about Wagner. Um, this was thanks to the International Wimbledon Music Festival, which actually put on the Messiaen play a year earlier. And they liked it, and they said, let's have another one, what you got? And um, I, I offered them a few possibilities, and the festival director said, well, it is Wagner year, isn't it? <laughs> so I ended up in a situation where I had to produce a play about Wagner. And uh, talk about rabbit in headlights. Yes, very much so. Uh, so I, I dealt with that by thinking, well, who is my favourite film writer? And it is, of course, Woody Allen. So I thought, right, now I am Woody Allen and I'm going to write the play that I think Woody Allen would have written about Wagner. <laughs> and I proceeded to do that, so it's a little bit off the wall. But the premiere went extremely well and people laughed at the jokes, most of which are Wagner's own authentic funny lines. Um, and uh, it's, it's kind of crazy, but it kind of works, I think. And where, where is the next performance of that? Have you got a performance coming up? Nothing I can talk about oh. yet. I'm working on it. But more recently, you've been performing extracts from your novels in a highly innovative um, programme, really, of concert, words and music. So how did this materialise? Um, again, I was asked. Um, it was a, a case uh, that goes back a few years to when Hungarian Dancers was first published. And actually, before Hungarian Dancers was published, I asked my friend Philippe Graffin to read it and to read the manuscript and tell me if there were any kind of violinistic boo boos in it, because I was quite keen to be as accurate about yes. things as I could be. It's a very, very violin y book. Um, and he gave me back the manuscript with the words that there was nothing wrong with it that he could see, it except for one thing, which was that it needed a CD. Mm -hmm. And he wanted to make a CD, please. And um, so. Initially, I put together a concert of readings and music as a fundraising exercise. So we performed it in a beautiful salon in South Kensington, which helped to raise a good bit of money towards the making of that disc. Mm -hmm. And it's out now on Onyx, played by Philippe Graffin and Claire Desert, and it's called Hungarian Dancers, and it's very beautiful. Mm -hmm. um, and then after that, I went to do a reading from the book at a music library in Newcastle. And the music librarian liked the combination that I gave of a reading and then a piece from the CD so much that she suggested to a series director at the Sage that a concert of this would fit very well into their Fiddles on Fire festival. So next thing I know I get a call from Fiddles on Fire saying, do you like to do a concert? And uh, they, it was Philippe wasn't available for that one. They 
put me together with Bradley Cresic, who's the leader of the Northern mm. Symphonia, mm. who turned out to have a duo of 20 years standing with one of my closest friends. So it all worked out rather well, and um, it's gone from there. Excellent. Tell us a little bit more about the format, because you do Alicia's Gift as well. So you've got two programmes. Yes. Um, Alicia's Gift was the brainchild of another wonderful pianist friend, Viv McLean, who took part in the Hungarian dancers, concert accompanying David LePage, the leader of the orchestra of the Swan. And Viv loved the format, and he read Alicia's Gift and loved it. So he said to me, couldn't we do a concert of that as well? And I thought about it and decided actually we could. Mm -hmm. So the, the idea basically is that it's not just reading music, reading's music. It, it has to be very closely integrated. It has to be the right piece of music with the right reading. They have to suit each other really well. So that effectively the words and the music are telling the story together. Um, if it's just a sort of ad hoc throwing together of bits and pieces, it just doesn't work. No, it's not going to work, is it? Exactly. So where can we hear uh, Alicia's Gift and Hungarian Dances? Right. Alicia's Gift is uh, coming up on the 18th of January, um, which uh, I don't know when you're publishing this interview. It may have been gone. But no, right, you've got other performances yeah. coming up. Um, so Alicia's Gift will be around um, the place considerably in the summer in places beginning with B. Oh. <laughs> um, we have Buckingham on the 4th of June at the Radcliffe Centre at the University of Buckingham. We have the Holborn Museum in Bath on the 21st of June. Right. And we have the Buxton Festival on the 15th of July, which is particularly nice because mm. it's set in Buxton. Yes. And then I'm delighted to say that the Chopin Society uh, with their wonderful series at Westminster Cathedral Hall has booked us for the 21st of September. That's so very exciting. Very thrilled. I'm um, really looking forward to that. Wonderful. And you're going to give us a reading from Alicia's Gift now. So do explain to us whereabouts this, t this comes from in the um, programme. Okay, this reading is from roughly the centre of the programme. Alicia's gift is about a child prodigy pianist, the effect that her talent has on her family, and also the effect that her family has on her talent. So at this point, she's 13. She's with a very, very demanding teacher who's got her playing Russian scales and transposing Chani etudes and working, 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 and never really praising her or letting her play the things that she loves to play. And she's pretty miserable. Mm. And her parents are squabbling about what's best for her and she's working off the stress in the best way she can find in Boston. Lovely. We'll take it away. I can't, Alicia says, outside Mrs. Butterworth's house. I can't go in. Ali, we've been here for 15 minutes and it's not going to get any easier, Kate says. So go in, now. Alicia walks slowly up the steps. There, she slumps down with her back to the door, head in her hands. The dog, confined to the car, watches, whines and barks. Kate follows Alicia. Ali, are you all right? You don't know what it's like because she won't let you in the room while it's going on. At home, Guy says, Katie, this is ridiculous. She's only 13. I didn't ask her to be talented, Kate retorts. I didn't ask her to want to be a pianist. She can't have it both ways. She can't expect her to be what she wants to be without hard work. Oh, Mum, comes Alicia's tearful voice from the direction of the piano. Please don't yell at Dad. It's not his fault. Outside Buxton, in the Peak District National Park, Man Tall rises out of the landscape like a capsized ship buried among the hills. It's the beginning of the Pennine Way. And this, Guy has often told Alicia, is the backbone of England. On every side, the view offers her colours as elusive and mutable as those she pictures in her music. But this almost treeless landscape is most natural in winter. Low cloud impaled on outcrops of rock the wind tearing at Alicia, as if determined to lift her off her feet and over the edge. That's when she loves it most. 
she can stand with an ecstasy of rain drenching her, letting the elements pour out the feelings she can't pour out herself, except in music. Thank you so much for joining me today. Thank you very much for having me.